hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this week's episode of HealthSpan Academy. My name is Kyle Freiberger. I'm your host. Joining me is my co-host, Craig Sherhart, and our very special guest uh, and strongman athlete, Ryan Green. Uh, hello, retired, Retired strong, uh, strongman athlete. Uh, uh, Iron, or sorry, uh, Ryan uh, started out as a uh, young child reading uh, a lot of fitness magazines and strong mag- magazines. Uh, he went to Conestoga, Conestoga College and uh, finished his schooling there at the age of 21, where he uh, was introduced to um, going on to a TV show, if I uh, remember it correctly. I'm uh, telling that the story. Is correct. But, so he ended up uh, on a TV show at 21 years of age and uh, without any training, started uh, lifting very up heavy objects and uh, realized that he was quite good at it and represented Canada for seven years all over the world. So um, with that in mind, really just want to jump in, um, start asking some questions about that. Um, Ryan, uh, welcome again to the show. Uh, Thank you, Kyle. So, you know, being a strongman athlete, like, uh, you know, I've got so many questions to ask, but uh, we'll start off with, you know, lifting heavy things. If you want to tell us uh, a little bit about, you know, what prompted you to get into that. Uh, I know you've talked a little bit about your Scottish uh, heritage and, you know, you're a big boy back, uh, back when you were a kid and, and uh, you just found kind of the natural talent for it. But yeah, just maybe uh, take us through that process and then we'll, uh, we'll jump in with some more questions. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up on a farm in a small rural community called Arthur and uh, just always, always a big, big kid, bigger than everyone in my grade. So growing up on the farm, all kinds of heavy implements and just farm life living and, you know, bailing and just whatever you name it. But yeah, you touched on, I went to Conestoga college and I became a welder and I was working in a welding shop and uh, it's funny I'd always followed the world's strongest man on, on TV. And, you know, they feature strong men in a muscle and fitness magazine sometimes. So I found myself lifting a lot of the implements, uh, things that you see them lifting on TV, uh, on a daily basis as a welder. And, you know, I remember thinking one time, wow, I'm not struggling as near near as much as uh, I see some of these other guys doing, but it's that mentality of bodybuilding versus real world functional strength. And that's what strongman's about. It's not just going to the gym and bench pressing. It's lifting something heavy day in, day out, over and over and over. Um, And you get really accustomed to that. The body acclimates to all of these crazy things. So I was working at the welding shop and uh, yeah, being Scottish, half Scottish by heritage. Um, I worked for a father and son and they convinced me to go into the Fergus Highland games, which is really big in Fergus. Um, And uh, I was doing the games and uh, a show called the all strength challenge uh, was having their inaugural competition and shooting there. Uh, It was featured on the outdoor life network for three or four years. But so I entered the competition and out of 25 guys with no actual bodybuilding training or weight training, just functional life training. Uh, I placed seventh out of 25 grown men who had been competing and training and all of that. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So from there, uh, the guy who was running the show was a former strong man and he's just like, you know, how do you train? Where do you train? And I told him, well, the answer to both of those is I, I don't, I just work. On the farm. Um, yeah. So he, uh, he asked me for my email and said, you know, I see a lot of potential in you. Cause I was six, I was actually almost six, three and a half at the time when I retired six and a half years later, just FYI, I was just a little under five eleven. Uh, I lost almost four inches to spinal compression and hip and knee compression. So, oh, wow. wow. Yeah. It, it's crazy. But, uh, yeah. So he's like, you're a big boy. Um, and you obviously know how to handle odd shaped objects. So he sent me some training tips and he, he told me, you know, implements to get, get some heavy tires and go get heavy field stones, which I had tons of access to. And I really, I just started focusing on training those. And uh, yeah, it was crazy. Within a year, I, I went to a local strongman show. I found the official, the official uh, circuit um, and qualified for Ontario strongest man went there and anybody who places top five qualifies for Canada's 
strongest man. And so I, I placed fourth and ended up going to Canada's strongest man. And from there, it was just a whirlwind within a year. I'd, I'd come second at Ontario's strongest man, top four at Canada's and got my pro card down in the States and just started getting invited all over the world competing. It was so surreal at the time. And even when I look back on it to, to just within a year have quit my normal job. I had my life planned out. I went to college. I had a, a, a real job. And now here a year later, I'm standing beside the guys that I grew up watching, former world's strongest men, you know, in a stadium full of 70,000 people getting filmed for TV. That's nuts. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was something. The, uh, yeah. One of the, one of the questions I have right off the bat was, you know, what's the, what's the biggest thing you've lifted or the most amount of weight you've lifted. And then what's the, uh, I saw some, some crazy pictures of you, uh, pulling along some trucks or there was some, I don't know if it was a bus or a truck, uh, you know, what's, what's the biggest vehicle you've pulled kind of how far, like what are, what are some of your, what are some of your PRs in that department? Okay. So one of the heaviest things I ever pulled was over in Latvia. We were there in uh, Riga, Latvia for a huge international competition. And one of the things we had to pull was a 96,000 pound cement truck, which just, wow. just shy of a hundred thousand pounds is the heaviest thing I've personally had to pull. Uh, now they had a world's strongest nation competition down in the Caribbean. Uh, we were down there for almost a month straight. And one of the events was to pull like a giant freighter that was out in the water. Now the freighter weighed something like a quarter million pounds, but it was spread amongst a bunch of people on mm -hmm. your team. So individually, yeah, that would, the cement truck would have to be one of the heaviest that I personally had to pull. Uh, but, how far did you have to pull it? Uh, most of them are, it's a hundred feet or 30 meters. So oh, okay. like things like uh, the truck pull is usually 30 meters or a hundred feet um farmers walk is usually 200 feet or sometimes they get sick and twisted and just make it go for as far as you can they <laughs> normally make it really heavy for that yeah. um one of the heaviest i again personally every if you want to call it carried uh it's called the hercules walk which is uh basically it's a giant wheelbarrow and they just keep putting weight in it now you only have to go uh we did that at uh, the gatineau balloon festival we also actually, I think, did it at one of the Canada Strongest Mans, but I know we did it at the festival. And it's a known distance. Uh, so it was 50 feet and they just keep raising. It's called a rising bar. So every athlete does it. Those who don't complete it, you don't go to the next round. Everyone who completes it, they add weight and everyone does it again. That's and nice. uh, yeah, so I, my personal best in that is just over a thousand pounds in the hands. So you wow. do like a, a quarter deadlift and then you walk with a thousand pounds in your hands it's as as slow or as fast as you want you just have to you have to cross the line wow wow i'm hoping i can jump in here because like yeah absolutely yeah i'm blown away by these numbers and i think like most people like can't even wrap their head around what that weight means so if we think back to traditional gym some stuff that most people have done like a squat bench dead deadlift do you have lifetime prs of those like what what were your numbers like for those lifts surprisingly so having never really walked in that world until i started um i am very very bad at linear lifting huh. um so my best deadlift ever in the gym is uh it's abysmal it was about 865 Oh, terrible <laughs> yeah just, hey, oh my god <laughs> in 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 the strongman world there that's it, it trust me it is um yeah. my my best bench ever was around 415 which uh, again that's horrible i'll put it in perspective uh five-time world strongest man winner marius pujanowski uh you can find video i've actually seen him do it where he steps into a squat rack and he shoulders uh, 200 kg, which is about 440 pounds. And then he proceeds to back out and do three very comfortable overhead shoulder press with that weight. So that is at, bananas. <laughs> as, a, as a bench press, it wasn't really that great. Uh, my yeah. squat, same thing, uh, about 885 was the best I ever squatted personally. Wow. Terrible. <laughs> You're totally, you're totally slacking. Yeah. So you're yeah. the guy that I was always wondering if you'd be the guy going to the gym to train and you just pick up the whole equipment instead of the, uh, 
because there was probably enough weight in the in the rack to do it. Instead of picking up a dumbbell, you just pick up the rack of dumbbells. That, yeah, that, just pick up the rack of dumbbells. That actually that actually was uh, somewhat of the truth. My my training partner and I at the time, once I got really into it and you know started competing internationally, I had to step it up. But it was very hard to find gyms here locally in Ontario that had the weight that we needed, like trying to find, uh, gyms, for example, that had dumbbells heavier than 180. We actually, mm -hmm. we would have to go down to golds. Uh, and at the time golds was still in business, but, uh, down in Mississauga where Paul Dillette, a uh, bodybuilder trained and, uh, Henderson Thorne was one of the part owners of it as well, former IFBB pro, but, uh, they had, uh, dumbbells that went to 220 pounds, thank goodness. So we could go and do our seated shoulder press or do our you know, dumbbell bench press. Wow. That's crazy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about training and you mentioned you didn't have much of a background and I know from the little, I know about strongman, we do a little bit of strongman in, in CrossFit, but with yep. much, much smaller weight than, than you guys would do. Uh, I know like even just hearing interviews from strongmen, it's like kind of a hybrid of bodybuilding versus powerlifting. And then the odd obstacles are kind of thrown in there. How would you describe once you got into a groove and training, did you kind of stick to the traditional kind of farm strong style training, or did you move more towards bodybuilding or powerlifting? What did that look like once you got into a routine? Uh, so strongman is very much like CrossFit, uh, mm -hmm. only a little more extreme, but it's centered around functional strength uh, you know right. strong strongman was kind of associated with the circus a hundred years ago and you know not just bend over pick it up set it back down once like powerlifting. right uh, you have to have muscular endurance so sure. rather than your single weight pr they're going to cut it back to 75 percent of your one rep max but how many times can you do that mm -hmm. but so for someone like myself even with my numbers uh like over in latvia uh, we did a car deadlift, but the weight in the hands was 640 pounds and you get guys. Now there's a bit of a bounce, uh, re reflex uh, that goes on, but sure. you get guys cranking out 15, 16, 17 reps with 640 pounds. That's nuts. Uh, and it's the same with, with the log lift. Uh, you know, you'll, again, maybe it's not the 400 pound max, but they'll do 325 pounds from the ground. But again, it's max reps and it's all time. So in 90 seconds, can you crank out 12 or 14 reps with a 300 pound clean and press? Wow. So I, like many of them, uh, you know, I needed to bring my powerlifting numbers up because uh, a good foundation of deadlifting is important for muscular endurance and to just have the raw power and sure. same with bench press and shoulder press, but ultimately it ends up becoming a, a hybrid of building muscular endurance and using specific bodybuilding exercises to, to really shore up because it's not always, or I shouldn't say that, but most often it, it's not a major muscle that will actually tear or blow out. It's always some supportive muscle that right. gets under trained mm -hmm. because it gets shuffled to the background because it's not a deadlift. It's not a squat, but you know, tearing a, an anterior or a posterior delt or, you know, one of the terrace major terrace minor can completely put you out of a competition or, you know, months worth of competitions because just For because sure. you didn't focus on those things. Yeah. You heard, you rarely hear of like a glute tear, right? Those big yeah. muscles. <laughs> it, no, it, it's a hundred percent true. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, if it is, those are the ones that get featured on TV, but yeah. when you're in the sport, and, you know, you get to know why certain people aren't showing up and, you know, half a dozen people won't show up because they've got such a minor muscle tear, but it's mm -hmm. enough that they, it, they just can't continue. Yeah. Fair enough. I want to segue onto that into the principle of deloading. Cause I think that's something that there's a, this is mixed across the board in terms of like, you know, I think like the young kind of meathead mentality is just push, 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 and the muscles can get strong enough at time, but the joints like don't quite keep up as, as well as the muscles do. What was your principle around deloading when you were training back in that day? How often would you do it? What did it look like? So unfortunately I was very young yeah. and I also, my whole education was centered around mechanical. I'm a welder by trade. I'm a, you know, multi-skill maintenance man by trade. Mm -hmm. uh, until my last uh, season or two, I had no knowledge of this. I, I paid my coaches and I trusted them, but right. 
also, once you get your pro card, it's always sunny somewhere in the world, just because it's not mm. uh, the right weather to have a strongman show here in Canada. Yeah. Uh, so deloading, once you, once you start signing contracts for competitions and agreeing, you're literally, sometimes you might fly, you don't even fly home. You'll fly from home to a competition site and compete for a week or two weeks or three weeks. Uh, and then you might be boarding a plane to the next competition site. So deloading is very few and far between for an inexperienced athlete. Right. But uh, my last season or two, I had a lot more success because I started learning from some of the older pros and gee, mm -hmm. why do you only see them do four of the biggest competitions a year? And why am I doing 17 shows a year? <laughs> because you competition know, was your training. Yeah. yeah you right. know, and it, it was also to my detriment, the, the older guys, the guys who had longevity in the sport had come to learn that, you know, I need to do a local, I need to do my country's strongest man so I can qualify for worlds. Right. And I need to do worlds to satisfy my sponsors and my this and my that. But mm -hmm. when you're 22 and hungry and trying to, I guess, prove a point that that 17 shows, it, you know, it makes sense in your head, but it, it, in the long run, it really isn't the smartest plan. Yeah. You just think you're invincible. Right. And it's true. And you don't feel pain. And yeah, we've, we've had a few oh, of those guys come to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> you feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm going to ask one more question just about nutrition. Then I'll pass it back to Kyle. Um, did you track your calories in the day or, or how do you have an estimate of what, what your daily calorie oh, consumption was like? Absolutely. So, uh, I competed anywhere from a body weight of 385 to my last couple of seasons, just north of 400 pounds. Wow. Um, and given my training schedule and my competition schedule, I actually found that I would start to lose weight uh, mass uh, at anything less than around 8,500 calories a day. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, that is it, nuts. It uh, was four, four times the recommended average. <laughs> yeah, it, it was ridiculous. And the other thing is, uh, again, you know, one of my nutritional coaches before I ended up getting my own nutrition certification, uh, he I was having trouble digesting because when you're eating almost a thousand calories every meal, that's a lot to digest. And two hours later, you have to have uh, another thousand calories but I was trying to eat on, you know, a 14 to 16 hour waking window. Right. So uh, he suggested, and he started having me set an alarm and I was eating on a 24 hour cycle where I would wake up in the middle of the night so I could wow. spread, spread my meals out and make them smaller. Yeah. But I started seeing gains again because I was absorbing more, you know, when you eat a thousand calories and two hours later you do it again, you're still not absorbed uh, what you just ate. So right. by making the meals fall smaller and spreading them out to that extra eight hours, uh, made a huge difference. And, you know, again, the, you can't beat science. And I started progressing again. Wow. That's bananas. And in terms of like, how, how concerned were you about quality and nutrition, nutrient density at that point? Are we just trying to get them in however you could? Uh, so, I mean, that's a question I've been asked a lot and, you know, the theory or the, the thought is, wow, you know, 10,000 calories and you're pulling buses and doing all of this crazy stuff. You must be able to eat chocolate bars and chips and this and that. Uh, but at, at that tier as an athlete, uh, it's like a race car. You yeah. get the performance out of the engine, what you put in. For sure. Now, I won't say that, you know, there was a lot of bread, but it was mostly sourdough bread. It was, uh, you know, again, being German, it was pumpernickel, it was rye bread, it was heavier, healthier, denser bread, but yeah. it was still a lot of bread, but it was chicken breast, it was a lot of vegetables, it was a lot of eggs, uh, you know, a dozen a day, sometimes more, mm -hmm. um, healthy fats, tons of avocado, I was fortunate enough to have a sponsor who was uh, also a grocer. So I mean, they didn't sponsor me money, but they sponsored me uh, an allowance for just for food. Because right. when you're spending almost two thousand dollars a month on food, it, it, it starts to add up. So that's crazy. Wow, yeah. that's that's insane. Um, so after uh, after kind of towards the end of your career, you were telling me the story about how you were uh, 
uh, you had just, I think just shy of a thousand pounds on your back and, and you happen to step into a little hole and, and compress your, or fracture your spine, compress your spine. Um, tell us a little bit about that story and then how that shifted your focus or how that changed your, uh, changed your life, I guess, uh, probably pretty dramatically. And, and you, you kind of turned into the person that you are today and just kind of t- talk us through that. And we'll ask some questions along the way, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, we were doing a, a, an event called the super yoke. So if anybody follows Strongman, you, you pick up, they, they have a solid three inch steel bar and they hang weight from it. Or we were doing, uh, it was two engines out of uh, Caterpillar bulldozers. So it, it, it weighed 985 pounds. And the objective is to pick it up and literally sprint for 30 meters. The fastest time wins. And I still remember this to this day, even though it was 16 years ago, the winner of that event was a uh, Marius Pujanowski, five-time world's strongest man with 15 pounds shy of half a ton. His time was 9.51 seconds. What? So, so to put that in perspective, the same year, the, the fastest time for any linesman in the CFL for the 40 yard. So we were doing 30 yard was, you know, it was around six and a half, five and a half, six seconds. That's just him running. And wow. Mar- Marius did it in under 10 seconds with, with half a ton. Holy smokes. That makes but, no sense to me at all. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I was, I was doing my, doing my thing and just at 400 pounds myself and then half a ton on my back, stepped into a little pothole that was a little deeper than everything else. Wasn't expecting it. And just that rapid extra drop, a uh, compression fracture of two vertebrae and oh. herni- herniation of four discs. So that was almost the end of my career. I was still on the hook to do one more. So I, it was a lot of aspirin and Advil and Aleve daily just to keep some modicum of training. Um, but as soon as I was done all of my obligations, I, I quit and retired. And yeah, I spent 22 months uh, I lost. So I went from af- immediately after I was close to 430 pounds. And yeah, I spent 22 months rehabbing and healing and I lost weight. I went down to 220 pounds. So I lost almost more than I ended up weighing, which is insane. Like uh, I, lost, I lost a whole person. Wow. But, a large uh, person. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's what kind of finished it all and brought me back to reality. And you were talking, um, when you were telling me the story about, uh, you know, the possible surgeries, possible, um, uh, you know, issues, uh, if you went down that road and you decided not to go down that road and kind of take your own, uh, personalized approach by, you know, learning and, and, you know, starting to exercise through calisthenics and isometrics and, and any of these other uh, forms of exercise to try and strengthen that spine and, and talk, talk us through that, how that, um, decision, um, you know, how you feel about that decision and how that, uh, how that changed your life as well. Yeah. So, uh, they wanted to fuse, uh, from L one right down to S one to support it. Um, but I knew a, a couple of guys on the tour who had had spinal surgeries, especially in the lower lumbar and, it just wreaks havoc with your life. That's mm-hmm. where all of your rotation comes from. That's where mm-hmm. all of your flexion comes from. Um, so be, prior to my injury, I had become a certified personal trainer and a certified nutritionist as well, um, just for my own edification and to understand what I needed to do uh, and not have that power in someone else's hands, be it my coaches, which I trusted and I, I'm very thankful for. But uh I just, I looked at all the data on spinal surgeries and how invasive it is and the the longevity of such a thing. And I I just decided there has to be a better way. So being a mechanic, um, and this is how I uh, approach my training and the training of all of my clients and have ever since, is break down the mechanics of the body. Where are the insertion points of the muscles? How is it supposed to function? What is its function in the body and in life? And through that, I come up with a series of exercises that work for me. I I don't say they work for everybody. Uh, It's not coincidental that I use them for most of my clients because they're functional muscles that we all need to develop. But as you mentioned, uh, Kyle, it's my 
routine, and it has been to this day, is calisthenics over lifting weight because it teaches you how to brace your core, which spinal stability comes from bracing your core, but it's not mm -hmm. just it's not just the rectus. It's not just the six pack that people think of. It's, it's about bracing the deeper transverse abdominis and, you know, your core actually starts right at your sternum and goes to just about your knees. Mm -hmm. It's all the muscles in the chain, both uh, posterior and anterior. So, you know, proper pelvic angle, clenching your glutes, you know, making sure your pelvic tilt is proper and just bracing entirely. That's, uh, you know, I do a lot of planking. I do a lot of um, a single arm, single leg planking as well, which is one of the things that I really credit with keeping and maintaining the spinal health I've gotten back is engaging what's called the myofascial sling. So cross body connection of the deep fascial tissue. Um, I love the TRX. I love kettlebells. Anything that puts you off balance and forces you to consciously be aware of your movement and really engage the core before you engage singular muscles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, and, and then endurance as well, right? Like I don't think Absolutely. a lot of people understand that even when you're walking, you know, some engagement in your glutes and hamstrings and, and abdominus muscle, uh, ab, ab uh, muscles, like that, uh, there's just like a low continuous engagement all the time when you have it done properly. And that, uh, that really protects you. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I appreciate you touching on that. And then, um, I guess just further, furthermore talking about like longevity, right? Like we're, you know, I always like to ask, uh, our, our interviewer ease, I, uh, longevity questions. So, you know, trying to live, uh, trying to live as long as possible and as healthy as possible in as good a shape as possible. Right. So you obviously changed your mindset, um, from lifting heavy things to, you know, that endurance, the calisthenics, um, any other routines that uh, really pop up that are like fundamental for you that, uh, you'd like to share that, uh, you find that are kind of a staple in your life that, that help you, you know, kind of cross off all those, uh, or check off all those, uh, boxes that, uh, will help you live as long as possible, not just as long as possible, just healthy as possible. A absolutely. So yeah, yeah uh, I lift, I lift calisthenically. Um, I also do kettlebells once a week. Uh, I will do kettlebells because you can condense a lot of work in a, a short amount of time. But one of the biggest mentality shifts uh, I've had, uh, partly in my own self and through a lot of the, the courses and upgrade education I've taken since is, you know, how much muscle does a person need to carry around versus how mm -hmm. much time do you spend on your connective tissue, which is what attaches the muscles to the bone? How much time do you spend on your heart and lungs? Uh, so I've had a huge shift in my own training philosophies as to how I train myself and how I train my clients, how I train my family, my wife. You know, we spend a lot less time on building muscle uh, and we spend a lot more time on maintaining whatever muscle we're comfortable with to allow us to live the life we want. My mm -hmm. wife and I are very active. We love to do a lot of outdoor things, hiking and biking and walking, but that really doesn't require me to be near as big or have near as much strength. Uh, I have more than enough strength to do all those things, but now I spend a lot of time focusing on quality of contraction and full range of motion, ensuring that I engage all the muscles, uh, you know, from big to small, but foam rolling. And uh, I'm a big fan of infrared and red light therapy to really, as we get older, muscles stay supple far longer because they have a lot better blood supply. But as we all age, taking care of the connective tissue and taking care of our joints, especially for me, that's a, a very critical thing because mine took a beating, but we all, you know, we all age, especially, you know, you look at knees, hips, ankles, these things over the course of a lifetime, I still want to be able to do what my wife and I do. I still want to be healthy when I'm 150. And mm -hmm. yeah, I did say 150. I've said it from the time I first married my wife is, you know, there's no reason biologically that you shouldn't be able to live well past a hundred years old. It's all about taking care of yourself. And, you know, that comes through physicality. It comes through mentality. Um, I use diet and nutrition as well. 
because I really paid attention during my last year as an athlete and, and since then to chronic inflammation, stress, and, you know, some of the courses I've taken and upgraded since then uh, that touch on how damaging chronic inflammation is and how much that mm -hmm. shortens our life far more than we think. Mm -hmm. um, and internal problems, uh, especially digestional issues that can kick up a lot of cortisol and inflammation and stress that we're not consciously aware of, but still contribute to a lot of damage systemically. Mm -hmm. And do you yeah. work with uh, anybody in your life uh, professionally um, to help you with some of these things? Uh, I have in the past. Uh, I've uh, So he sponsored me some treatments and I in turn uh, did some guest demonstrations for him. Uh, a doctor down in Toronto. Well, actually, I think he's out in BC. I haven't talked to him in a while. A uh, man by the right. name of Dr. Ken Kanakin. Um, he used to hold the Swiss conference every year. And basically, it, it's more about just total, total holistic wellness. Mm -hmm. Um, but as of, as of my retire, no, I, I have kind of just taken the reins and all that. And really, you know, if I didn't have the education that I felt I needed, I would just pay and, and go and get it. Um, right. yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the things that I'm really excited about, and I, I've been doing the last couple of years is there's a great certification out there called functional aging specialist, which is basically just about, uh, kind of what I touched on. And it, it has remodeled my philosophy of what does growing older look like for the body and how can we slow that process as much as possible? But it, it, it touches even to the extent on using balance training and using exercise to mm -hmm. maintain neuroplasticity, how exercise and movement actually affects your brain and how yeah. you can keep your brain young mm -hmm. through specific movement is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. I was I was telling Kyle right before the episode, it's like people see these big, strong dudes and I'm like, dude, most of them are pretty smart. <laughs> like <laughs> strength training, lifting heavy stuff is amazing for your brains. And there's actually tons of papers that support it now. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I just want to wrap things up a little bit. You kind of talked about your own habits and that's actually how we normally segue to, to wrapping things up. Um, and you summarize that really, really well. And I fully agree with the whole principle around longevity. And the more that we're learning, the more it seems to make sense that we can live much longer than people are, especially because there's people living to a hundred that are like chronic smokers and hardly even active. Yeah. So imagine if you put this kind of knowledge in their hands 50, 60 years ago, right? That's kind of where, where my head's at. So I thought that was a really cool point. I want to know if there's like a, and you, and you've talked about a lot of the sort of uh, the stuff that Colin and I are totally on board with, with, with like red light therapy and longevity and the whole pieces. Has there been a reference you've picked up in the last like year or so, a book that's kind of stood out for you? That's kind of been your go-to in terms of like um, your own knowledge base around anti-aging longevity and, and health span. Uh, I would say, and I mean, it does, it does go to longevity. It goes to connectivity, um, especially now in the time of pandemic is the dysfunction not just in fitness and health, but the, the dysfunction in people. So it's a, a great book called It's Okay That You're Not Okay uh, by Megan Devine. Mm -hmm. um, the book itself is focused around helping people deal with grief. Uh, just before the pandemic, my wife and I lost our son. Oh, wow. But, but uh, it, it touches on the fact that simple things the reason I'm here talking to you guys is you're trying to reach a bigger audience and, and help a bigger audience, but that is a, a dying thing. And her book touches on, you know, when someone asks you, how are you doing today? Even if you're dying inside, even if, you know, it was a fight to get out of bed, the, the cultural mentality is to tell people you're okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because you're not supposed to burden other people or you're not supposed to do these, this and that, but, uh, just like, you know, taking care of myself physically is important. Uh, since then, my wife and I have noticed, uh, and especially since reading that book, telling people you're not okay or that you're having a really bad day ha has opened up some amazing conversations and experiences, not just for us uh, to get it out, but uh, for other people to actually, uh, we had one specific one, and, and the, this was a young woman, and she had lost her mother about four months prior uh, and we were at the grocery store and she asked my wife how she was doing and as per the book if you're not doing good tell people you're not doing good and 
this girl just broke down and she asked, you know, she said, my shift ends in half an hour. Would you guys mind sticking around? And, and that's how we found out that she had lost her own mother. And wow. every book on grief had told her that she's supposed to just struggle through and it will get better. And mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't get better. But at the end of two and a half hours of talking this with this young lady, she she felt better. I don't know if she's still doing better, but she felt better. But yeah. none of it would have come about, you know, if we'd have followed the cultural norm of just saying, oh, I'm fine. But hmm. that's part of her her whole philosophy is that we are a broken society. And it's my hope that on the other side of the pandemic, uh, that's one of the things that will get fixed is we're all in this together. We're all on the right. same planet. It doesn't matter what culture you are. It doesn't matter what color you are. We're all alive. And you know what? We can all help each other. Mm -hmm. I have experiences. That's why I'm here talking to you guys that, you know, some of your readers might enjoy or, you know, it might help them. But your readers or your listeners or followers, they might know something that I don't know. For it's sure. this free share and this free passage of information that, you know, that's what makes us all better. And, you know, again, going back to exercise can help the brain. So can emotions. So can, you know, getting rid of all of that negativity. That is also a, a vehicle for longevity is don't carry those things around. Yeah. I think this is yeah. a whole another episode on its own. Cause <laughs> for sure. I just want to, you know, the, the last part about what you said there, um, you know, I'm always worried about sharing my burdens with other people as well. Cause I'm, I'm wondering if it's a selfish thing or a selfless thing. Like I don't want to, you know, cause any distress to anybody else around me. And I feel like I'm emotionally pretty strong, but then you forget that. Yeah. Well, maybe somebody else has an experience or maybe that openness will allow somebody else to share what they're feeling. And then, you know, and I think, like you say, the, the society norms were, were always something that I, I knew I didn't want to be like everybody else in that sense. And I think that if people are uh, able to, get uh, one message from even this, this conversation is, is worrying less about what other people think. And then like looking at this perspective of, of that conversation. So, you know, looking at it from like, Oh, I might learn something from somebody else, or, you know, if I tell them my problems or, uh, or share my problems, right. Like it's just, it's a mentality shift. And then it, uh, it allows people to be a little more open society. Obviously we're, we're in this pandemic together and that's uh you know, that's a, a very real thing and it's caused a lot more openness for sure. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time today, Ryan. I think we'll wrap this up and, and call it uh, call it another great episode and maybe have you back on the show sometime. Yeah, That would hopefully. be awesome. Craig, Kyle, thank you very much for having me on today. Well, thanks for being here, man. We appreciate it. Uh, so thanks for tuning in today, guys, and HealthSpan Academy, and we'll see you next time.